Welcome to Johns Hopkins Medicine Online webinar series. Today, Johns Hopkins Department of Radiology will be exploring medical physics education and training tomorrow's leaders in radiology and radiation oncology. Before we get started, we'd like to provide some user tips so that you are comfortable using this platform. The first half of our program will include an informative presentation by our presenters. The last half will be dedicated to our live Q&A session. To submit a question, please type your question into the Q&A box and click send. Your questions will be seen by others watching this presentation, so please note, if you do not want your name attached to your question, please check send anonymously. We will do our best to answer all the questions we receive during the Q&A session. Alternatively, you can email us questions and feedback to hopkinsseminars at jhmi.edu. Please note this program is being recorded. At the end of the webinar, we would greatly appreciate receiving your feedback and ask that you complete our survey. A pop-up window will appear at the end of our program for you to complete the survey. And now we would like to begin our presentation. Yeah, thank you so much, Joy. And thanks also to everybody that has joined in. Uh, I want to emphasize that this is a joint program where radio radiology has pa partnered with radiation oncology. Uh, we affectionately call it JUMP. So if you take the second P and sort of turn it on its side, that lo looks like a, Q, uh, a U. Um, anyway, so this is the, the second live uh, webinar. The first was when we first uh, launched this program. And uh, I'm just going to provide a brief overview of what this program is about and the progress we have made. Next slide, please. Right, so the mission of medical physics is to advance medicine through excellence in the science, education, and professional practice of medical physics. This, this is coming from uh, CAMPEP, the uh, body that accredits uh, medical physics program. And it is an update from our last webinar, which is still available on our website. The master's program has been a success. We, we got it CAMPEP accredited uh, before the first the, the inaugural class uh, graduated. So. All the classes coming out, out of this program have been CAMPIP accredited. Program is now in its fourth year. We have added a PhD program and we're really excited about that. And we are on our way to establishing a certificate program. Next. I want to highlight uh, sort of the philosophy of the program and kind of its objectives. Um, we want to make your time as rewarding as possible in terms, in terms of both long and short, short and long-term objectives. And also, we want to expand what medical physics is. Uh, Hopkins has a pretty strong MRI group here, and uh, there are options to take some of the, uh, the uh, MRI-related courses, as well as AI uh, as, uh, uh, as electives. Um, and also to highlight the tremendous value that medical physicists can bring to research endeavors beyond just the role of a clinical medical physicist, although that's super important as well for things to work properly. And also meet and ideally exceed your own definition of career success. Uh, we have an unparalleled resources here at Hopkins and also in the broader community to make this possible. And finally, my sort of personal uh, uh, um, objective is to foster role models. I believe that unless you see yourself in a particular position, it's hard to, um, to um, to recognize that you can you can um, be somebody in in that profession. Next one. Next slide, please. So I'm going to quickly introduce our next speakers. Uh, uh, Professor Ja will talk about the in more detail the, about the PhD and master's program. Professor Knudsen we'll uh, talk about women in medical physics. And then we have our, our two students uh, that will talk about student experiences. And then we'll end with uh, administrative topics, how you can apply, where you go to apply, and things like that. Next. Thanks again for joining. And you can contact uh, me or, or our current administrator at the email shown here. OK, so now I turn it over uh, to yeah, Professor John. Uh, thank you very much, George. 
Um, my name is Xunjia. I'm the uh, Chief of Medical Physics Division at the Department of Radiation Oncology. Uh, I'm going to give you more details about uh, our uh, master's program and PhD programs. Uh, next slide, please. So as uh, George mentioned, so this is truly a joint effort by the two uh, medical physics divisions in the Department of Radiology and the Department of Radi Radiation Oncology. Uh, we have our uh, master program inaugurated in 2021, and that was designed for a full-time uh, program for full-time students who wish to uh, participate, uh, pursue a career in medical physics, either as a researcher, a, a certified clinical professional, or industry. And this program requires a 38 minimum of 38 credits and the completion of a research thesis in order to graduate. And since we started the program in 2021, and uh, this uh, program received a CAMPAP accreditation in 2023, so that the uh, graduate students can pursue for um, a career, board certified uh, clinical medical physics career. And we had uh, 11 students enrolled so far. Uh, out of them, four has uh, graduated, and six of them are currently in the program with one student who uh, left our program pursuing a different career. Uh, next slide. So uh, this slide just to give you an overview about what courses uh, uh, are included in our curriculum. Uh, per CAMPAP require requirement, we have the six or uh, seven, the uh, core uh, graduate, uh, graduate cur cur curriculum that is listed on the top section. And because of the uh, focus of radio pharmaceutical uh, uh, in this program, so uh, we also require the completion of two courses uh, that are related to nuclear matter imaging and radio pharmaceutical therapy. And uh, as George mentioned, we have a, a very uh, dynamic and active research environment in Johns Hopkins campus that, that we can, our students can uh, take many elective courses in order to meet a different research and uh, uh, clinical goals. So uh, I'm just listing uh, some of these uh, elective courses that our students can, can take. And in addition to that, uh, our students will um, need to do a research uh, uh, thesis so that they will uh, work with uh, PIs to complete a research project. And uh, those projects are uh, offered by the PIs and it really depends on the student's interest and the PIs need. And finally, we also offer a seminar that for the students to explore different uh, areas in the, um, the frontier of medical physics. Next slide, please. So this slide shows the uh, the the, st the statistics, and from the table on the right, you can see how many students we have uh, uh, received application, and how many has enrolled, and how many has graduated, and where they are uh, now. And for the application side, Debbie will provide more details. But basically, uh, we, we require uh, bachelor degrees in physics, applied physics, or relevant relevant field, and we are actually uh, accepting applications now. Uh, in, and the, the, the application will close uh, February next year, and the tuition will follow the uh, Hopkins guideline. Next slide. And this slide is a, uh, web, shows a web page of our uh, master uh, program, and there's a barcode. So if you take a, uh, the, the, uh, the following this uh, barcode, you can go to this uh, web page directly. Okay. okay, moving on to the uh, introduction to our PhD program. So uh, we are very excited to have our PhD program established uh, mid this year. Uh, in June, we received the Maryland High Education Council approval uh, to uh, allow us to build it, uh, to start this PhD program. And again, on the right side, you see the web page and the barcode that can link you to there. And uh, this is really the first medical physics PhD program in the state of Maryland. And we are very excited to have uh, this program here. And that also marks the first PhD program for both the radiology and the radiation oncology departments. And one special highlight of this uh, program is very strong research uh, focus. And uh, acro across the two departments, we have many PIs with extensive uh, uh, funding support uh, that can um, that uh, uh, can provide supports to our students. And uh, we are again, again, we are in the process of recruiting our uh, first batch of students for entering in fall 2025. And the deadline of application is uh, December. Next slide, please. So why um, uh, um, uh, students want to pursue a PhD program? So uh, there are many, many reasons, but of course uh, for st uh, students who are pursuing a PhD uh, degree, uh, one main one of the main reasons is for a strong research focus. So uh, with that, we build our uh, PhD program to meet that needs. So for students entering our program, you will have uh, plenty of opportunities to explore the state of the art uh, medical physics research and be part of it. And also for those of you who are interested in pursuing a combined clinical and research career down the road, uh, you will have to um, uh, 
uh, follow the uh, medical physics residency after graduation. And with a PhD program, there are data showing that uh, there's a better acceptance rate for medical physics residency program, uh, which is 96% program, 96 for PhD students uh, versus 78% uh, for master students. And of course, with uh, the uh, combined uh, clinical and uh, research training, uh, the, it's sort of a qualification for top tier academic clinical institutions. And of course, uh, uh, you, you also will be able to join the, uh, the medical physics community and uh, play a part role, an important role in leading the uh, become international leader in these areas. And you will be enjoyed by uh, the medical physics research and the clinic. And for our program, uh, the tuitions are um, waived and uh, students will also receive the stipend provided by the PIs. Next is nice. For our program, uh, we uh, um, have a, a set a setup with a dual tracks, and we expect the students will complete uh, this the training within about five years program uh, time time duration. The two tracks are a clinical research track and the the research track. And for the admissions admission side, uh, the students will be direct lab ma directly matched to the PI's lab. In other words, when you enter the you are admitted to the program, you know which PI to uh, work with. Um, and uh, in the first year, first two years, the uh, the students are ex expected to mainly complete the course trainings. They will complete the CAMPAP accredited courses, which are the same as the medical physics master program. And uh, they will uh, complete uh, uh, 36 credits uh, and, to and also to have to maintain a GPA of 3.0. At the same time, they will conduct uh, research projects under the PI and they will have to complete the so-called doctoral board oral exam in order to um, confirm their candidacy for PhD. And in the remaining three to uh, three remaining years uh, of the PhD trainings, um, so they will complete the ABR part exam for those of those students who are in the clinical track, and they will annually complete a uh, annual individual development plan meetings with the PI in order to um, confirm their progress. And uh, of course, they will continue to do research projects under the PI, uh, meet with thesis committee meetings to make sure everything is on track, and finally write and defend the thesis in order to graduate. Next slide, please. Uh, the, in the last uh, two slides, I'm going to talk about the future career after the uh, finish of the uh, training. So for uh, both the master and the PhD students, uh, of course, if they are uh, interested in going to academic or industrial career, the, the main research, main focus is research. But for those of you who are interested in the clinical training, a very important part is to pursue a board certification by the American Board of Radiology um, so that they, they can students can be uh, board eligible and board certified to perform uh, medical physics work in the routine clinic. So since uh, um, 2022, the ABR uh, mandates that the students have to receive uh, um, the training in the CAMPAP program uh, in order to take part one exam. And since 2024, uh, they have to uh, receive training in the CAMPAP program to receive take, take part two. And this uh, uh, slide sort of shows the uh, pipeline. Uh, basically, we are uh, our program offer you the first step training to uh, receive CAMPAP certified program in the uh, master or PhD setting. And after that, you will be eligible to take part one. Or, and then you will move on to residency training and move on from there. And the last slide, next slide. Yeah, so this uh, slide shows the uh, statistics uh, in uh, 2021 about the number of programs in the in the uh, United States and, and uh, inter actually internationally, but with the majority of in the U in the U.S. Most of them are therapeutic uh, residency program, and uh, um, about a, a, a quarter or one third of them is about on the imaging side, and the programs are mostly in the U.S. and uh, some are in the Canada, and uh, a few of them are uh, in the international. So with this, I'll conclude my presentation and uh, hand over to Dr. Newsom. Okay, thank you so much. So uh, my name is Linda Knutson and I am a medical physicist and I'm also Professor Parr at the Department of Neurology and I am teaching the medical imaging system at the master course here. So I'm going to talk about women in medical physics and women and ethnic groups have historically been underrepresented in this field. So I'm going to start by mentioning some of the women that made important contributions to medical physics despite facing barriers in their careers. And we will also look at some of these barriers 
and why diversity is important, and as well as how Johns Hopkins addresses these issues. So I will start with Marie Curie. She is one of the most famous scientists in the world. She conducted pioneering research on radioactivity, and that led to significant advances in cancer treatment through radiotherapy. She was the first woman to receive a Nobel Prize and the first person to actually win two Nobel Prizes in different fields. For the first Nobel Prize, despite her significant contributions, including coining the term radioactivity and conducting the fundamental research, the Nobel Prize Committee, they only wanted to give the prize to her husband and Henri Becquerel. So it was her husband, Pierre Curie, who insisted that Marie Curie's work should be recognized. And thanks to his advocacy, she received the Nobel Prize. So what is not so what she is not so well known for, I think, is that she actually did development in X-ray too, and she developed uh, mobile X-ray units to help treat wounded soldiers during World War One, and she drove the first uh, mobile X-ray unit to the front lines with her daughter and uh, worked with the military doctors uh, to X-ray wounded soldiers. And to increase this capacity, she also trained 150 women to operate these X-ray units. Another very famous researcher is Lisa Meitner, and she was the first to provide a theory of nuclear fission. She was also the first woman in Germany to become full professor of physics. And although she was very crucial uh, for the discovery of nuclear fission, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry was awarded to her collaborator, Otto Hahn. And throughout her career, she got nominated for the Nobel Prize several times. And many of her nominators are well-known figures in research like Arthur Compton, Niels Bohr, and Max Planck. So, Shen Xu Wu, she worked actually in the Manhattan Project, and she was the first woman that was hired as faculty in the physics department at Princeton. And what is interesting that is that the university then only had an all-male student body. And she was the leading physicist on uh, beta decay. So therefore, physicist uh, Tsung Dao Li and Shen Ning Yang asked her to design an experiment and the purpose was to test um, to test the theory that parity for weak nuclear interactions. And her experiment confirmed their theory for which they won the Nobel Prize in physics. And the Nobel Committee didn't uh, include her in the prize. So Rosalind Sisman Yalo is quoted as saying, the world cannot afford the loss of talents of half its people if we are to solve the many problems which beset us. So she got inspired to go into science after she read Marie Curie's uh, biography. And she was the only woman among 400 faculty members during uh, her PhD. And she also had to work as a biochemist secretary secretary in exchange for class classes, since it was very hard for a woman to get assistantships back then. So she developed the radioimmunoassay technique, and that is a method for measuring small quantities in blood. And she applied this technique to insulin. Her husband actually had diabetes and demonstrated that in type two diabetes, the antibodies react to insulin. And she was, uh, awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine for her work. So all these women must have felt like outsiders in their profession and often probably not being so good treated by their environment. So, but these women had a few allies who supported them. And one example is Pierre Curie, who told the Nobel Prize Committee that he would reject the prize unless he could share it with Marie Curie. 
So let's dive into why there was and still is a lack of women and also under other underrepresented group in higher education and research. So the leaky pipeline refers to when underrepresented groups drop out of STEM at various stages of education and careers. And as we can see here, I hope you see it, there's a huge drop from PhD graduates to female researchers in this leaky pipeline. And this we also can see in the field of medical physics. So this is actually statistics from Sweden, since I am from Sweden. And as you can see, medical physicists, actually more than 50% of the medical physicists in Sweden are women. And also medical physicists who has a PhD is very close to 50%, but at these levels, it tends to be less women. So the reasons for this are several, and some of them are that um, women in academia often encounter biases and discrimination, and that can lead them to be overlooked for promotions and or their contributions are not being valued. And also uh, they might not have supportive mentors and colleagues. So, and research have actually shown that when a female mentor uh, ha is mentoring a PhD student, the dropout rate is significantly lower than if there is a male in mentor involved. Um, so another thing is that academia is publish or perish environment and, and that can make it then difficult to balance work and family responsibilities and limited access to affordable child care and parental leave policies can also make it even more difficult. Uh, women often earn less than the male counterparts, even for comparable work in the academia. They're also asked to do more academic household work, and that can include sitting in committees because so sometimes a committee needs at least one woman in it, and if there then are only a few women at the department, they get less time to do research, which then makes less chance to get grants because and write papers and do research. So all these previous points can then make them feel undervalued and unrecognized. So how is it then in medical physics in the US? I showed you Sweden. Well, compared to fields like physics and engineering, medical physics has a much higher proportion of women here. And we can see also from 2010 that the number has risen steeply. We also see that those that are in medical physics field as master student, PhD student, resident, approximately 40% are women. So there is a power of diversity, and some of it is that people with different life experiences approach problems from different angles, and this can lead to more innovative and effective problem solving strategies. Also, diverse team members will contribute to the group with wider knowledge and skills, and then they can easier help identify critical issues and develop solutions and increased creativity. When members feel comfortable sharing their thoughts and ideas, they are more likely to engage in discussions that drive innovations. And if we look in the business, it has been shown that companies in the top quartile for gender and ethnic diversity, they are 39% more likely to outperform financially than those in the bottom quartile. So there are some strategies to break these barriers and promoting diversity inclusions, and they are like mentorship. This is one of the most impactful ways to support underrepresented groups in science. Workplace advocates can ensure that their work is acknowledged and appreciated, and Advocates can also address unconscious biases and discrimination. And 
Advocates can also make introductions to valuable networks, opening doors to collaboration and career opportunities. And advocates can assist their colleagues by championing adaptable work structures like remote work, part-time alternatives, and family-friendly policies. So, and the future looks bright because if we look at the Generate and see, that is the most rapidly growing group in the workplace. They are more passionate about diverse and inclusive workplace than any other generation. And if we look at Insight Global, 83% oh, I, I think it went back or here, 83% said that an employer's commitment to diversity is significant when choosing where to work. And 75% said they would consider applying to a company if they were unsatisfied with its diversity inclusion effect. So I want to end my presentation by looking at how Johns Hopkins ranks in diversity among national universities. And according to US News and World Report, Johns Hopkins tied for the third highest diversity index among 435 national universities. And for Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, that is the home to the medical physics programs, one of the core values is diversity, equity, and inclusion. So with that, I would like to hand over to Natalie and Caitlin. Yeah, thank you, Enda. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Katie Kelly, and I'm a second year master's student in the medical physics program. Uh, so I originally graduated from Creighton University with my bachelor's in biochemistry and a, minor, and a minor in biophysics, and I'm currently applying to PhD programs in medical physics. Um, a huge thing with this program is this program has allowed me to engage in various research opportunities, which helped me decide that I wanted to apply to PhD programs so I can one day be a clinical physicist and a PI, much like the professors here at Hopkins. I'm currently doing research with Dr. Sangeeta Ray during radio pharmaceutical research and with Dr. Kai Ding uh, researching in radiation oncology where we combine external beam radiation therapy and immunotherapy. Uh, but that's not all this program offers. This program offers a lot of clinical aspects too. And so clinically, I've been able to see the diagnostic side. I've been able to shadow Dr. Colin Paulbeck and Dr. Troy Zhou, who are both diagnostic physicists. And I've also had a job opportunity with Dr. Zhou where we test the lead aprons throughout the hospital using fluoroscopy. Uh, and being able to research in radiation oncology and nuclear medicine and also see the clinical side of diagnostic has really allowed me to see the broad aspects of medical physics. And I'm super grateful that this program has allowed me to explore pretty much anything I want. Um, Everyone here is super supportive and all the professors here I've talked to, I've told them I'm, I have a lot of broad research interests and just research uh, interest in general in medical physics. And everyone has been super open to that idea and has allowed me to see a piece of what they do, uh, which has really been impactful for my career development and also personal development in figuring out what I wanna do in the future. Uh, I'm forever grateful for all of the professors here, as well as all the friends and connections I've made. Yeah, thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Natalie Kenya. Um, I completed the medical physics master's program just a few months ago in May of 2024. A little background about me for undergrad. I got my bachelor's of science studying biochemistry and biophysics at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. And then I found medical physics while I was an undergrad and decided to pursue my master's here at Johns Hopkins. Uh, I am currently a therapeutic medical physics resident. Uh, with a Varian residency program located at Safe Hope Chicago in Zion, Illinois. Uh, some other important and exciting things about me is I just took the ABR part one board exam in August and I passed. So I can uh, definitely say that these classes will prepare you for those um, professional experiences uh, when you graduate. Um, so I just want to take a few minutes to share with you how this master's program played a crucial role in preparing me for this next step of my career. 
Uh, so first, I just want to highlight how supportive all the faculty are with the students. Uh, they are not just there to teach you, but they do take interest in guiding you, helping you grow as a professional and finding uh, what areas interest you the most. Throughout my time in the program, the faculty really pushed me to think critically and approach challenges with confidence and to never be afraid to be curious and ask questions. Uh, They're always there to answer questions, offer professional advice, um, and help. they helped me discover my potential through their support. Uh, they generally care about helping you find your interest uh, in what's most important to you, and they're willing uh, to work with you as long as you're willing to work hard and seize the opportunities and use the resources that are available to you. And that brings me to another good point about the program. Um, there is just so many opportunities that are available to you. Like Katie said, no matter what your interest, as long as you're willing to you know, work and seek out those opportunities, they're there for you. Everyone's happy to, to work with you and to teach you. Um, and you're gonna find the best fit for you in this program. Uh, the best advice I can give to an incoming student is really to just take advantage of every opportunity you can. The more you put in, the more you're gonna get out of it. Um, and each opportunity you take will help you grow um, and help you make those connections from the classroom to clinical applications. Uh, me being in residency now, you definitely take all that knowledge you learn in the classroom and it's how do we apply this to real world scenarios. And I think an advantage of Hopkins is they do that in the master's program is when you start not only learning, uh, you know, just the knowledge, but you're really learning how to apply it and to think critically. Um, so I just wanted to give some insight onto uh, my experiences in the program and how uh, it's helped me to get where I am. So while I was at Johns Hopkins, I had the opportunity to dive into some incredible areas of medical physics. I had the great pleasure of working with Dr. Segaros on my thesis in the Segaros lab, uh, where I analyzed quantitative spec CT images of patients treated with an alpha emitting radiopharmaceutical. This is a really growing area of research in medical physics, and it's it's definitely unique to Johns Hopkins, I think, just like the level that you're able to dive into this, and it definitely gave me a unique perspective when I was going through my residency interviews, too. Um, I also was able to get hands-on experience in the therapeutic medical physics side. I worked as a physics assistant where I did patient-specific QA. Um, I built TBI trait compensators, and that's when I got to really learn how um, to work with the uh, linear accelerators, learning how to troubleshoot problems and seeing firsthand how the clinical therapeutic physicists um, work and how they solve problems. Uh, this clinical experience solidified my desire to do clinical work and helped me help set me apart during my residency interviews, having that experience, knowing how to use uh, my way around a LINAC. Um, and then through that, I was also able to build connections with people in that department. I was able to get involved in clinical research as well. Um, and I was able to submit an abstract to AAPM. So I would say that that research also helped me see how clinical professionals identify problems in their area, and then how we approach that. How do we do that, have that discussion? How can we come up with solutions to these things? And just how do we investigate our field for, you know, continuing improvement? Um, so during my two years, I took advantage of every opportunity I could, and it really helped uh, grow and shape me professionally. And now I'm in my residency and I'm really set up well. Um, so to anyone considering a program, uh, know that it's not just about earning your degree, it's about opening doors to countless opportunities, getting hands-on experience, and being mentored by experts who truly care about your success. The well-rounded education experiences will prepare you for the board exams and beyond. I know the program prepared me well for my residency, and I'm confident it will do the same to anyone who is passionate about the work that they do and they have the drive to work hard. Um, thank you. I'll hand it over to uh, Debbie to go over some administrative uh, points. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I'm Debbie Race. I'm the administrative specialist in the radiological physics division. And I also administer the um, medical physics graduate programs, the MS and the PhD program. Um, next slide, please. So just a reminder, um, this may have been mentioned in earlier presentations. So, so the deadline for the upcoming PhD program is gonna be December 3rd, 2024. And that is, uh, you have until midnight. Um, for those applying strictly to the master's program, um, our deadline is February 1st um, in 2025. Um, the applications are available online 
And um, so a few of the requirements that we have, we want to receive a CV and a resume. You have to have transcripts from every university that you've attended. Um, we will accept unofficial transcripts at the time of the application. When students are admitted though, they will have to provide original transcripts um, before classes start. We like to see three letters of recommendation, um, personal statement for the master's applicants and their calling it career objectives for the PhD program. Um, so the GREs, after much discussion recently, we have decided that the GREs are optional. Um, if you have GRE scores, that's fine. If you don't have the GRE scores, that's fine also. Um, neither application will be looked at any differently um, than the other. So, um, and then of course, we do like to see um, TOEFL or ILETS um, scores for any international applicants that um, didn't uh, you know, get a degree from a US or a school that uh, uh, the education is in English. Next slide, please. Um, this is, uh, you saw this earlier. So this is the front page of our master's in medical physics program. Um, we are accredited. And um, so when you go to our website, this is the first slide that you're gonna see or the first page that you're gonna see. Next slide, please. And then further down is where you have, you can um, see Dr. Segoros' um, introduction or welcome. Um, the informational webinar is the first webinar that we did back in the spring of 2021, um, the tab for our faculty curriculum. Um, and then you wanna see the how to apply. If you were to click on that tab, that takes you to the website where you have more information, what's required and um, deadlines and, and more financial aid information, all kinds of good information. Um, and then again, contact information. Next slide, please. So again, how to apply. These are our basic requirements, the degrees, the uh, you know, we like to see a degree in physics, applied physics, at least at a minor. Uh, the applications, again, February 1st for the master's, December 3rd for the PhD program. And then um, if you're accepted, so what we have found is, is when you upload your documents into the, the online application, everything should be there by the deadline, which for master's is February 1st. But we realize that the applicants don't have any control over what the uh, faculty recommenders do. So if your application didn't happen to have it, maybe two letters of recommendation, that's fine. We don't hold things like that against the applicants. So um, you're not going to find that very often. I think the faculty are really good at doing that. So um, that'll take care of that. Next slide, please. So then when you hit that apply now, this is the pay that's going to take you to um, where you would apply either as a first time user, you would create an account, or if you're a returning user of applied before, or like Kelly, I felt like Caitlin, she, she's probably got a master's application and then she just logs back in. Um, that's, that's about all there is as far as the applying. It's not that difficult. And I don't, I don't think I have any more. Then there's the contact information down there at the bottom. Um, I don't think I have, do I have a next slide? Yep, I think that's it. Okay, and again, just to contact. So as of right now, I am the contact until November 8th um, for, for if you're, we, we, we'd like to have anybody applying to the master's program to send us, um, you know, queries or questions through the medphysicsms at jhmi.edu and the same for any applicants to the PhD program because different faculties are gonna be looking at different, different degree programs. Um, and then after November 8th, um, Lynn Gibson will be the contact. And I have listed a couple of websites at the bottom of the slide, the division website. Um, so the medical physics program is actually, um, falls under the radiological physics division. So you, you, you would, you know, you might wanna go visit that website, take a look around, you know, see what's going on. And then the application website that's listed there takes you to all the on-campus programs. And they also give you more information on financial aid and, um, and, and a lot more information that can be provided, you know, School of Medicine wide, not just, just our program. Um, so I think that's it for me. Thank you. Looks like we do have one question. I have, I have degrees from the UK and Sweden. 
should I submit a WS grade conversion log with the unofficial transcripts? Um, Debbie, right. do you want? I'd say no, if the, if the transcripts are in English, no. And I would imagine, I know in the UK that English is the language of instruction and uh, Professor Knudsen can verify um, what a transcript would look like um, from Sweden. But I, I, you wouldn't need to have a WES grade conversion, no. So there's another question. I'm sorry, another question, but let, let me go to the ones that were posted before we even started. Are there any specific requirements or, or challenges for international students in this program? Well, the only specific requirements for international students for applying to the program was they have to provide some sort of TOEFL or IETLS if they don't have uh, an English, uh, you know, their uh, degree didn't come from an English speaking institution. Um, the only challenge that I've ever come across that I'm aware of is sometimes communication. Um, I, but other than that, I don't, I don't think there's any specific challenges. Um, what international students have to do that domestic students don't do, though, is if you're accepted and you're not in a program, if if you're not applying for a PhD program where the PhD students are fully funded, then um, as a master's applicant, you have to upload documentation of um, self-funding. So you'd have to provide all of that. So that's something that's different for an international student as opposed to domestic um, other students. Um, okay, and the second one uh, 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 submitted before we started, what is the usual duration and cost of the program? Are there payment plans or scholarships available? Well, so the duration of the master's program is a two-year program. Students are here taking courses fall, spring, year one, we expect that they stay for the summer and do restart their research in the first summer. Then again, they're taking classes in the second year, fall and spring. So it's a two year program for the masters. We're anticipating that the PhD program students should be uh, matriculated and graduated within five years. Yeah. You know. Right, and and there, uh, the whoever the PI is for, whoever the principal investigator is for the PhD. Right, right. Movie. So yeah, when PhDs are accepted, they're accepted by a specific faculty member that will say, this applicant is interested in the work that I'm doing. They're going to offer you admission. The PI is the one that pays, you know, that's the ones that supports the PhD students. That's coming from their grant. So they're grant funded. You're going to work on this project. This project's going to pay you. So that's, and that's, that's university wide. Um, PhD students are all self, are all fully funded and it's through PI's grants that support them. Um, the master's program, unfortunately, um, this year our tuition as a as a private university tuition for this academic year is uh, $64,665. Now we are um, looking at getting some sort of, you know, at some sort of funding or scholarships for the master's students at this time. Um, we don't have that right now, but that is something we are looking into. So master students are self-funded. Okay, so it looks like we have 15 questions and what, uh, uh, about, I guess, 16 minutes left. So uh, let's pick up the pace. So um, PI stands for Principal Investigator. Basically, this means someone that's doing research, research that is grant-funded and has money to hire a graduate student to do the research work that will then lead to a PhD. Um, uh, let me go back to uh, our stipends provided for the master's thesis program as well. Uh, what we do offer is uh, not, uh, I guess the answer is no, but there is an opportunity to, to earn some income by working in, in uh, our clinical radiology or maybe clinical uh, therapy, physics, there are examples where some of our students had, have done some, some work and gotten paid for. Otherwise, there's no, uh, there's no uh, stipend. Um, okay, if we're only interested in research, do we still need to take up residency at a hospital? Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but the answer is no. So 
uh, so for the PhD program, there are two tracks. If you're interested in uh, only research, uh, you do have to take the, the campus uh, accredited master's uh, uh, program courses. Um, uh, the residency um, isn't a requirement if you're going to stay in research. If you want to then uh, go to a more clinically oriented uh, uh, position, then yes, you do have to take residency. Shun, did I say that right? And that's correct. Okay, uh, for clinical research PhD programs, the GRE required, uh, we've decided to make it optional. What can I do to be a competitive candidate? Uh, study hard and work hard and be creative. Uh, do you offer medical physics certificate program? Um, at this point, no, but we're working on it. Okay, these are popping out. What is a competitive GRE score for applications? Uh, We've made it optional, um, so I don't really know. Does anybody know? No, I mean, we don't have any, there's no baseline that we look at. I mean, because they take everything into account, so it's not just about the scores. Okay, so let's see, as other questions indicate, as well as the PhD websites, it seems that the general GRE is required. With a, will the general GRE be required for 2025 applicants? Is the applications due soon? and the website was established so recently. Uh, no, GRE is not required. This, are the scholarships for master's students? Uh, we're working on it. Okay. Do you accept any additional recommendations aside from the required three ones? Do we? Um, I'm not really sure if you could even put in more than three. It, it, you know, when you're in the application, I'm not sure if you could put in more than three letters of recommendation, but you can certainly send us one and we can put it in our files I just not can't confirm that you can upload four letters in in the application site. Right, and also I think it's a question of fairness. I mean, if if everybody's submitting three and thinking that's that's the what what they need to do, and somebody submits four, uh, yeah, I would. I guess I would discourage that. Okay, can I apply to both PhD and master's program in the same year? I'm guessing no. Uh, I, I, yeah, I think what we decided to do is if you applied to the PhD program and for some reason didn't receive an offer from a PI that's looking for a PhD student, we would contact you to ask you if you're interested in being considered for the master's program. So, Okay, so we have about uh, more than 10 minutes and we're on question 13, unless more questions popped up. Is the res residency required? Uh, I think that's on our website. So residency is required if you're going to go to a clinical track. If not, if you want to stay in research, it's not required. Does attending this webinar qualifies us for application fee waiver? What other options are still available for international students? I mean, good good question. No, it does not uh, uh, qualify you for the fee waiver. Um, okay, what does funding look like during summers? Does the funding only cover academic year or is it a yearly funding? You know, I think if you're in a PhD program, that depends on, on UPI, um, on, you know, whoever's got the grant that's supporting you for your stipend. PhDs I mean, I would have guess. have to be fully funded. Yes, yes, right. I would guess if you're working in the summer, you're being funded in the summer. PhD app students, yes. Right. Uh, do I need experience in biology and chemistry for, me or for medical physics, or it's just physics fine? That's a great question. You know, I would say because we want to bring in more people, we, what we'll do if, is if you don't have a, a physics core, if you have biology and chemistry, uh, uh, that's fine. What we would ask is that you um, take a, a high level physics class. All right, so we're on question 17. I will be graduating with a camp that accredited master's in medical physics in spring of 25. Will, will my PhD be five years long if I apply to Hopkins? Will I have to retake all the camp of accredited classes I've already taken? Um, I think we've kind of decided to um, assess that on a case-by-case -case basis, but probably not. If you've taken those things and you have a camp of accreditation, I think you can just go into research, but I mean, I wouldn't take com my complete word on that. So anybody else have any thoughts on this? I think the committee that's steering that, I think they're looking at that now because other questions have come up regarding that. Right, so, uh, okay, let's see, where was I? Um, 
Uh, okay, so 18, since PhDs are funded, hold on, do I need to scroll down on this? Uh, will it help with housing as well? Um, well yes, yeah, so what happens is as a PhD student, you will receive a tuition waiver. Your PI will have to pay for your health insurance. It also includes vision and includes a yearly stipend. So that's what covers your housing is your yearly stipend. I mean, it's up to you where you decide, you know, where your housing is going to be, how much you're going to pay. But yeah, so as a PhD student, tuition waiver, health insurance covered, and you get a, a stipend. Okay, so 18 was the last question, but we got one more. Uh, what sets a career in medical physics apart from radiology? I'm an undergrad currently deciding between the two. Um, well, so I would say if, um, if you like physics um, and you're interested in sort of medically oriented kind of thing, then medical physics is what you go. Radiology is a medical specialty. So you need to get your MD degree and decide to focus. Uh, are we li li limited to radiology? So I don't know if I answered that last one correctly, but um, um, right. So radiology means you're a doctor. Medical physics means you're a, uh, a medical physicist. So they're two different, completely different pathways. Are we limited to radiology and radiation oncology? What so uh, uh, those are the the key programs. So I would say no. If I mean we've had people that were interested in MR and have done things with uh, AI related stuff. So once you're, you know, once you're here, it's a big department with lots of different things going on. So no, you're not limited to those two things. Okay, uh, running out of breath here. So for a letter of recommendation from my faculty, is it okay to ask a professor who knows you even from a big class size? It is important that you got a good grade from that class. How personal does the professor need to know you? Or is it enough for them to speak for your participation grades? and perhaps office hours. Uh, you know, that's getting into the weeds, uh, but I'll answer it. So, you know, pick the best, the person that you think will do the best job for you to promote your, your application. Um, yeah, you yeah, somebody that knows how well that you would perform in a graduate program. I mean, they, right. they sh you know, they should be able to attest to you being successful in a graduate program. All right, I think uh, I'm holding my breath here. I think that the, uh, we, we've done 21 questions in less than 15 minutes. Uh, and this is recorded. So if you want to uh, replay with, with, I don't know, half the speed, you can do that. I may sound a bit funny, but uh, it'll be posted. Okay. Um, are we done? I think uh, uh, somebody left. Oh, since it's a new program, is there any cutoff for undergrad GPA? I do think we have a cutoff. Uh, Debbie, you probably know. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the applications that we have been getting and what we look at, we'd like to see at least a 3.0 yeah. minimum. Right. Yeah. All right, you know, maybe, uh, um, uh, let's see, where's Joy or, uh, um, is it up to me to cut it off? I think we addressed all the questions. So thank you for doing all that. Um, so just a reminder, this is being recorded. So all attendees will receive a recording in the next couple of days. So we appreciate everyone joining and everyone's attention. Thanks so much. Great. Yeah. Thank, thank, thank you, you all. Thank you, Kelly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Bye bye.